This is part three of lecture three. In this part of the lecture, we're going to be diving into the controlled uh, route of processing information. So we have this automatic route in which we rely on heuristics when making decisions, which is great because it's very efficient, it's smart, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, quick. But it's also flawed in a way because these heuristics also can make us uh, to uh, make bad decisions, social decisions. So we're now going to zoom into the controlled uh, thinking style. And uh, typically, this is a sort of the more superior thinking style. It's where we sort of use every, all the power that we have in our brain to, make, to come up with good decisions. But in this part of the lecture, we're going to see that also this controlled route of processing information is a bit flawed. And sometimes, even when we really try our very best to make good decisions, yeah, our brain works in ways that we still end up making bad decisions or having uh, bad uh, intuition. Uh, so uh, let me start off with an example for you to, uh, to get a sense of what I mean. So here you see a family. These are all kids of one set of parents. They have 12 kids, and they are all boys. All boys, 12 kids, what are the odds, right? So uh, now let's imagine, no, not, not imagine, this actually happens. This family, the Schwann family, uh, the mother got pregnant again. So if I ask you to estimate whether this next kid will be a boy or a girl, what would you guess? And even though that you probably are familiar with the concept of, you know, what the odds are when someone is pregnant, that the odds are pretty much 50-50, so you, the best answer when using a controlled thinking style would be, it's 50-50, I don't know, right? But still we have, if we have an example like this, our brain also works tricks on us. So we feel like we can sort of, if there's 12 boys already, the chances of adding another boy Having a family with 13 boys, that's a very, very low chance, right? So you th think to yourself, after 12 boys, it must be a girl. Or you think to yourself, if it's 12 boys, it's probably going to be another boy. Both styles of thinking is incorrect. Uh, we don't know. It's 50-50. Um, but still, our brain sort of plays tricks on us because we feel like we can predict this. We can control this. Um, so for this example, the 13th baby of this family was... Another boy, yes. And the story doesn't end here, because after the 13th boy, the mother got pregnant again. Child number 14, what do you think? Another boy. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And then a miracle happens. The 15th baby, it was a girl. Unbelievable. So the Michigan couple finally welcomes the baby after having 14 boys. Well, this is what I call persistent. I have three boys myself. I don't think I'm going to take it this far. <laughs> it's too extreme for me. Um, so uh, this is just for you to show that, uh, that our brain tries to understand the world around it, even when, when there's just odds, even when things are random. Um, we have this very big desire to control the world around us, and we do so all the time. We see, for example, relationships that are not actually there. This is called illusory correlation. So we, you know what correlation is, right? That there's a, a relationship between two factors. And we oftentimes have the idea that there's a correlation, a relationship between factors that, are, that is not actually there. I also, I'm your social psychology teacher, but I have these illusory uh, correlations as well. Uh, for example, I feel like every time I'll, I go outside and step on my bike, it starts to rain. You know, I feel like there's a relationship there. The times I decide to go by bike, it's going to rain. So I experience this correlation that's not actually there. I don't control, I don't actually control the weather. You know, I don't have that power. But still, we feel like we do have that power. And um, especially when the odds are higher, so we want to control the outcomes of things that we really can control, we use this. For example, um, we also feel like we can control outcomes by changing our behavior. This is something that you can witness if you visit a casino. Uh, this has been uh, used by observation research, so people, researchers, go to casinos and observe people. And when uh, uh, the players want uh, the, the dice to have a small number, like for example one or two, they roll the dice very slowly. And if they want a higher number, they really throw the dice. 
So they have this, they change their behavior based on the idea that they are controlling the outcomes. This is called an illusion of control. So it's sort of related to the illusory correlation, but this is I do something, so I roll dice, I do it slowly, and then I feel like I have a higher chance of having a small number, or I throw them and I have the idea that I get a higher number, which is of course totally, you know, it's not happening. You don't control the outcome of the dice by the speed of throwing the dice. Uh, also, of course, people do this all the time. You wear your lucky t-shirt. Uh, if you are watching, for example, your favorite uh, uh, team uh, playing on television, so you're not impacting the game at all, but still you really need to wear your special socks because then your team will win. So these are all examples of our you know, rational brains, we are smart, very smart creatures, uh, humans, but still we feel like we control outcomes that we actually don't. Um, and we do so especially when, it ch when the stakes are high. So for example, if it's a very important match uh, of a very important moment, uh, then we really uh, want to wear our lucky t-shirt. And ironically, we also want to do this, we want to change our world, we want to control our worlds after things happen, especially after disaster strikes. And this is what happens to this guy you see here in the picture. He's standing by himself all alone. Um, for the Dutch people, he probably looks familiar. His name is Sven Kramer. He's a long-distance ice skater. And for a long time, he was the king of long-distance ice skater, skating, especially on the 10K. So 10K of speed skating, he was the champ. And he, he was just unbeatable uh, for a long time. Uh, but then something happened. Um, in the Olympic Games of 2014, he didn't win. He got silver, so second best. The second from the entire world. You would think that he was, would be you know, ecstatic, right? He would be so happy. But actually, research shows that people who win silver are oftentimes destroyed. They're not happy at all. Here uh, on the right-hand side, you see the winner, who is obviously happy, but also with Bob de Jong, who is embracing the winner, he's also super happy. Bob de Jong, who won bronze, the third prize, so worse than Sven Kramer, is happier than Sven Kramer. And this is something that it, once you, if you watch uh, the next Olympics or uh, World Game, you oftentimes see that people that have the silver prize are destroyed, are just uh, so sad. And this is also referred to oftentimes as the silver drama. Um, and for Sven Kramer, this was even worse because uh, something happened uh, in the last Olympics before where he was disqualified because his coach gave him the wrong instructions. And after this race in 2014, the Olympics race, he was really driven to win the gold medal once again on the Olympics, but it never happened for him and again. So, and the chances are, you know, he's not going to win this uh, again. So this makes it even more painful, even though it's really weird because this is something, he got a good outcome, he got silver, but people are not happy with silver. It's sort of also what happens in a completely different scenario. I'm going to paint you this picture now. Um, something I read in the paper a couple of years ago. This is of the postcode lottery, which is a lottery in the Netherlands in which people from a certain postal area can uh, win a prize. So uh, this is about a certain guy, Kamal. Uh, let's read along. So Kamal can forget about the millions. Instead, he received flowers from the postcode lottery. Kamal, who lives in the millionaire street in Sittard, a place in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands, and has been taking part in the lottery for years, doesn't win any money because he didn't have enough money on his account for the direct debit to take place in the crucial month. So the moment, the, the exact month that he could have won the prize and he could have become a millionaire, he was too poor to, for this direct debit to take place. So this is heartbreaking, right? Uh, and for Kamal, uh, this is just something that you cannot even, you know, you cannot wrap your head around it. It's so bad. So if something like this happens, or um, the, the, the race, the, the silver race of uh, Sven Kramer, what these people probably, Kamal and Sven, engaged in is something that psychologists refer to as counterfactual thinking. And counter, counterfactual thinking is sort of our endeavors to try to mentally change some aspect of the past as a way of imagining what could have been. For Kamal, it's so easy to just imagine if I only checked you know, my account, if I only made sure that I had enough money in my account, then I was a millionaire. And for Sven Kramer, it's probably if I just uh, you know, was a little bit faster in the corners on the screen, then I could have 
won the gold medal. So if something happens, if you feel like you could have controlled the outcome and you just made the wrong call at a crucial moment in your life, this is something that people just have a really hard time dealing with. We experience a lot of regret, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration if this happens. Counterfactual thinking. That's basically, it's the impact of what could have been. I was so, so close of getting that prize, of, of winning that award, of, of winning the medal. Um, so um, people spend quite some time to try to control things in our life that we cannot control. So that's sort of the unpleasant truth I want to tell us, talk to you about. We have less control over the outcomes in our life than we think. Ironically, though, when it comes to things we can actually control, we make mistakes as well. And this is, uh, for example, illustrated in the planning fallacy. And this, the planning fallacy basically means uh, that um, we overestimate, we have more positive ideas about how quickly we can uh, 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 wrap up a project than is actually the case. For example, you probably now, we're still quite in the beginning of the course, you will think, you know, I will just go to that exam, it will be flawless, I will just watch, watch the lectures, I will just read the book, and I will do the exam, and then everything will be fine. Maybe you even postpone, you know, watching the lectures, because you feel like, yeah, I can easily do that in the three weeks before the exam. You know, I have plenty of time then, so I can just do it then. And we fail to realize that our reality is oftentimes uh, different. Oftentimes things happen. Maybe you get sick. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, your cat eats your book. Maybe something else happens. Uh, you get distracted. Maybe your boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you, leaving you destroyed, in, uh, un incapable of studying for the exam. So we tend to ignore all the obstacles that are still in our way. And that's something that's illustrated uh, here. And the planning fallacy is also one more example of sort of the unrealistic optimism uh, and sort of the exaggerated self-esteem that people have. We have the ideas that we can control the world, we are in control, we know that we're going to rock it, while instead uh, things will oftentimes be more difficult than we, uh, than we uh, think. So I'm telling you this right now in the beginning of the course, keep this in mind, the planning fallacy, while you're working towards uh, your exam. Still far away, but make sure you have a good planning that also takes you into account the obstacles that you will come across. Thanks for watching. This is the end of the lecture.